Mad because his incompetent subordinate was doing odd things like this during a negotiation, but getting into an argument here would not be productive either, so Ains quickly calmed himself down. It's nothing much, it's just that I happen to have a talent pertaining to that field. Oh, Ains was even more interested, and he leaned forward, straining to listen. Much like martial arts, talents were abilities that did not exist in Yggdrasil, but which were unique to this world. About one in every two hundred people was born with a talent. While talent holders were not rare, the abilities themselves varied greatly in potency and type. For instance, there were talents like being able to predict tomorrow's weather with 70% accuracy, the ability to strengthen summoned monsters, hastening the harvest by several days, using the magic of the dragons which once ruled this world, and so on. However, all of these were inborn abilities, which could not be chosen or changed. It was quite common to encounter situations where these abilities could not be applied. If someone was born with a talent that could improve the destructive power of their magic, but they never had the chance to become a magic caster, then their talent would be useless. There were very few people who could make good use of their talents. There were almost no talents which could dictate the course of one's entire life, apart from a few exceptionally powerful talents. The best proof of that statement was Gazef Stronoff who was a warrior without a talent. However, people with combat-applicable talents tended to go into the adventuring profession. Therefore, talent holders were a common sight among adventurers. The person before him was one of those lucky few who could fully utilize his talent. I think his talent had something to do with being suited to studying magic, and he only took four years to learn what should have taken eight years. I'm not a magic caster, so I'm not sure how great that is. Ains was a magic caster as well. Those words made him curious, and awoke a collector's desire within him. This was an ability which the great underground tomb of Nazareth did not possess, and which could strengthen the organization. If he could gain control of that ability, it might be worth making enemies of everyone here. Shrinking the time it took to learn an ability like this should have been the province of a super-tier spell, wish upon a star. The two of them continued talking without realizing that Ains was watching them under his helmet, like a tiger ready to pounce on its prey. I'm really lucky that I was born with this ability, because it allowed me to take a step closer to my dream. Without this power, I would have ended my days as a lowly peasant. Ninya's muttering was gloomy and solemn. As though to sweep away the grim air hanging over the room, Peter continued in a completely different tone. Well, no matter what, you're still a famous talent holder in this city. Still, there's people more famous than me. The leader of Blue Rose? That person's famous too, but I was talking about someone within this city. You mean, Berisher, shouted the last person, who had not yet been introduced yet. Ains was curious about the name and asked, and what sort of talent does that person have? A look of surprise came over all four of them. It would seem this was common knowledge. Ains had asked that question, because he was curious and wanted to acquire an ability which could strengthen Nazareth. Therefore, in response to the regret he felt over his carelessness, he told himself that there had to be some way to recover from a mistake like this. However, before Ains could explain, the other side came to a conclusion of their own, I see, the reason why we don't know you at all despite that stylish full plate and your beautiful companion is because you're not from around here, am I right? Ains nodded at this heaven-sent mercy of a question. Indeed, that is correct. The truth is, we only arrived here yesterday. Oh, so you wouldn't know then? He's a famous person in this town, but he's probably not that famous that distant cities would know about him, huh? Yes, I've never heard of him before. If you don't mind, could you tell me about him? His name is Nfiria Berar, the grandson of a famous herbalist. His talent allows him to use any magic item. Not only can he use scrolls of a different spellcasting system from himself, he can even use items made by the non-human races. Even items restricted to those of royal blood shouldn't be a problem either. Oh. Ains tried his best not to let them hear the awe in his voice. How much could his talent do? Could he use the staff of Ains Olgaon, which only the guildmaster could use? as well as world-class items? Or did it have limits? He was someone to be wary of, 
but he could be very useful as well. Narbrel seemed to feel the same way. She brought her mouth close to where Ain's ears would be under the helmet, and whispered, I think that person is dangerous. I know. Coming to this city was the right decision. Mom and San, is something the matter? Oh no, it's fine, don't worry. Speaking of which, could you tell me about your last friend? Yes. He's a druid, Dine would wonder. He uses healing spells and magic that controls nature, and he's well versed in herbal lore. Let him know if there's anything wrong with your body. He has medicine that's good for stomach pains. Pleased to meet you, came the greeting from the burly, barbaric-looking man with a full, bushy beard. However, he seemed younger than how Ains appeared. There was a very faint smell of grass from him, which came from the cloth pouch tied to his waist. Then, it's time for us to introduce ourselves. She is Nabe, I am Mammon. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Wonderful, I hope we'll get along. Then, Mammon San, just address me by my first name. Right, well it feels a little wrong to get to business so abruptly, we should probably start discussing the job. As for that, the truth is what we're asking you for doesn't really qualify as work. That means, upon hearing Ain's confusion, Peter extended his hand to halt him, with the intention of delaying the question for a later date. This job is to hunt the monsters that appear around the town. Clearing out monsters, huh, that was enough to count as work. Or was there some special adventurer reason which made him say that it did not qualify? Ains wanted to ask about that. But if this was common knowledge, asking that question might make him appear clueless, which was bad. Therefore, he tried asking a safe question instead. What sorts of monsters will we be exterminating? Ah, we're not exterminating monsters. After hunting monsters, the city council will pay us a reward based on their strength. What do they call it where you come from, Mom and San? So that was it. Ains understood. When Peter said that this did not qualify as work, in Yggdrasil terms, it was more like killing spawned monsters and taking the items they dropped. This is something we have to do to make a living, said the druid, Dine Woodwonder, in his deep baritone. Following that, Luckrut spoke up as well. For us, it's making a living, but what we do also reduces the danger to the surrounding people. The traders can come and go in peace, and the country can collect its taxes. All in all, it's a way to earn money, without anyone losing out. Nowadays, most countries with guilds do this, but five years ago, this sort of thing was non-existent. It's quite surprising. Everyone in the team nodded as Ninya spoke. They began chatting amongst themselves, leaving no openings for Ains to cut in. Still, it would be odd to know absolutely nothing about this country, so Ains decided to shut up and listen to what they said. It's all thanks to the Golden Princess, long may she live. She proposed a policy through that would waive taxes on adventurers, although it never got passed. Oh, to think she paid so much attention to adventurers. Indeed. Some rulers would treat armed organizations who were not loyal to the country as enemies. Even the empire isn't so generous. That princess sure is brilliant, coming out with all these great proposals although almost all of them were shot down. I want to marry a beautiful girl like that then, shouldn't you work on getting ennobled? Ah, uh, no way, no way, I couldn't live a stifled life like that. I think being a noble's not bad. After all, the kingdom pretty much allows a noble to trample the peasants, and do as they please. There was a strong undercurrent of mockery hidden beneath Ninya's words. Ains furrowed his non-existent brows within his helmet, but Narbrel remained still, a nonchalant look on her face. Luckrat replied in a jovial tone, You were that tongue of yours is still so vicious. You really hate nobles, don't you? I know that some nobles are honorable, but my big sister was taken away by that pig. I can't not hate nobles. We're getting sidetracked here. We shouldn't be talking about this sort of thing in front of our comrades, Momenshire and Miss Nabe. After Dine tried to get everyone back on track, Peter coughed in an incredibly fake manner before continuing, and so, we'll be searching for monsters in the nearby region. We're close to a developed region, so the monsters shouldn't be too strong. 
Does that displease you, Maman San? Peter spread a piece of parchment on the table. It looked to be a map of the surrounding region. The map showed villages, forests, rivers, and so on. Basically, we'll be heading south and looking around this area. His finger moved from the center of the parchment to the vicinity of the southern forest. We'll be hunting monsters in the forest bordering the slain theocracy. The only creatures who can hit the back line are goblins with magic items that grant flight. However, we won't get much for killing such weak monsters. Ains had his doubts about this group's easygoing attitude. From what Ains knew, there were many kinds of named goblins in Yggdrasil, and their levels ranged from 1 to 50. Since individual goblins could vary widely in power, one could not lump the goblins into one big group. A moment's carelessness could lead to dire consequences. Did their relaxed attitudes mean that they were confident of not encountering high-level goblins, or did it mean that this world's goblins were simply that weak? What if a powerful goblin shows up? While it's true that powerful goblins exist, they won't show up in the forest we're heading towards, because these goblins are usually tribal leaders. They won't mobilize their entire tribes just for us. The goblins know about humanity's area of influence, so they're fully aware of the retaliation that'll be headed that way if they launch a large-scale attack. It's especially true when it comes to the stronger goblins, since they tend to be the higher-ranked and more intelligent members of their species. Plus, Nabesan can use third-tier magic. So it should be fine even if we encounter high-level goblins, right? I see. However, I'd like to remind you that there are goblins who can use third-tier magic. Just for my reference, could you tell me about the monsters we might encounter? The Swords of Darkness turned in unison to look at Ninya. Picking up on their thoughts, Ninya began explaining with a teacherly look on his face. We're likely to encounter goblins and the wolves they raise. As for other monsters, there haven't been any strong ones sighted around this area. The most dangerous monsters we might encounter on the plains are probably ogres. We won't be entering the forest? Yes, because the forest is very dangerous. We can still deal with things like jumping leeches and giant beetles, but the hanging spiders, which spit webs at you from the trees, and the forest worms which maul you from the ground with their huge jaws are harder to handle. No wonder. Ains nodded in acknowledgement. So their aim was to hunt the monsters from the forest which made their way onto the plains. That's how it is, Mom and San. How about it? Want to lend us a hand? M.M. Then, I'll be in your care, although before that, could you tell me about the pay for this? Ah yes, that's right, the payment is very important. Basically, since Mom and San's team and our team are working together, the plan is to split it evenly. Going by the numbers in our teams, it seems awfully generous. However, when the monsters appear, I hope you and Nabesan will take half of them as well. We can only use spells of up to the second tier. So when we factor your abilities in, that division of the money seems quite logical. Ains pretended to think for a while before nodding his head in agreement. I have no problems with that arrangement. Then, let us fight shoulder to shoulder. Also, since we're working together, I guess I should let everyone see my true face. With that, Mamonga removed his helmet. The four people before him seemed quite surprised by what they saw. Black eyes and hair like Nabe San, so he shouldn't have been born in this area. I've heard that in the South, people like Mom and San are commonplace. Did you come from that region? Yes. We have come here from a faraway land. He's older than I thought. He's already an uncle. Hey, that's rude. A warrior on par with a magic caster of the third tier should be around that age. Miss Nabe's pretty amazing too. Ains' keen ears picked up their whispered words, with the exception of Peter's. Being called an uncle made Ains feel uncomfortable, but it probably couldn't be helped that he was an uncle in the eyes of these youngsters. If one was an adult by the age of 16, then Ains was definitely an uncle to them. I'll be covering my face up after showing it to you. There might be trouble if other people know I'm a foreigner. With that, Ains put his helmet back on again. After that, he smiled in satisfaction under his helmet. This was because Ains had enchanted himself with an illusion, 
although it was a low-grade type, which would be seen through if touched, just in case. Since we'll be hunting together, it would probably be good to get questions out of the way at this point. Do you have anything to ask me? Me? A hand shot up toward the ceiling after Ains asked his question. That hand belonged to Luckrut. After making sure that nobody else was asking a question other than himself, Luckrut cheerfully asked Narbrel, What kind of relationship do you two have? The room was filled with silence. Ains had no idea what Luckrut meant by that question. However, Peter and his people had picked up on Luckrut's intentions. We are companions. After Ains' answer, Lukrat's next few words threw the room into an uproar. I've fallen for you. It's love at first sight. Please go out with me. Everyone turned to look at Lukrat. After realizing that Lukrat's words were not a joke to deepen their friendship, Ains shifted his gaze to Narbrel. As the center of attention, Narbrel took a deep breath before replying, Silence, inferior life form, slug. Learn your place before speaking again or should I rip your tongue out of your head? The silence was even more deafening than before. Ah, no, Ains made to lighten the mood, but Luckrut stole a march on him and said, thank you for the firm rejection. Then, let's start as friends. Die, inferior life form, maggot. How could I possibly be friends with you? Or do you want me to gouge out your eyeballs with a spoon? After turning away from the feuding pair, Ains and Peter bowed to each other in apology. My comrade has made trouble for you. No, I should be the one apologizing. We'll call it quits, then. Is that all right? Peter looked around before speaking, though he kept his eyes from the grinning Luckrut and the cold-eyed Narbrel. Then, Mom and San. If you're ready, then let's move out. We're already prepared. After hearing the word ready, Ains suddenly thought of something. They had already purchased the minimum required gear from the innkeeper. Although Ains and Narbrel did not need to waste space on food and drinks, it would be weird if they did not eat or drink anything, so they had some ready just in case. All right, once we distribute the rations, we can set out right away. Are rations the only thing you need to prepare? If you're not going to buy them from a specialist shop, why not get some dry rations from the counter? They'll prepare them for you right away. Is that so? That's good to hear. We can finish our preparations right away. Then, let's go. Everyone rose and left the room. Diamond suit, diamond suit, diamond suit. After returning to the guild lobby, there were more adventurers than before, and there were several teams standing near the parchment covered notice board. However, everyone's attention seemed focused on a certain teenager. The blonde-haired teenager was talking to one of the counter girls, and the other two receptionists were leaning in to eavesdrop on their conversation. If things had been busy when Ains came in, the current situation was now the exact opposite. The counter girl's face, no, her mouth was in an O shape. It was a look of surprise. And the person she was looking at was none other than Ains himself. What's going on here? Just as doubt started welling up inside Ains, the counter girl approached and said, There is a job here asking for you by name. Those words changed the air in the room instantly. Ains could feel many curious eyes staring unreservedly at him. The Swords of Darkness were similarly shocked. Nargrel shifted briefly at the unpleasant change in the room's atmosphere. This was to make it easier to act during the critical early stages of a battle. Ains could not help but feel worried by this. This is bad, Narbrel's movements are bad. Judging by the way Narbrel stood beside him, she must have thought that something strange was about to happen, and had taken up a defensive posture to protect Ains. However, it was an action completely unfitting for a situation like this. Normal people would not do such a thing under these circumstances. Granted, protecting Ains was her top priority, but her movements were far too thoughtless. You idiot. Albedo's the same way too. What the hell are the both of you thinking? No, it's more like they didn't think at all. They feel like they can crush humans like insects because they look down on them. While that sort of attitude could not be helped from NPCs of a guild composed of heteromorphic beings, Ainzel Gown, 
there was a time and place for that sort of thing. An annoyed Ains wanted to ask his past comrades, why are all your NPCs like this? He did not care what kind of backstory they had, but they needed to have basic social skills, as well as the ability to take note of the time, place, situation, and respond accordingly. He did not have time to scold Narbrel now. If someone discovered that Narbrel was in battle mode, who knew what sort of trouble they might get into? Ains immediately karate chopped Narbrel on the head. Although he did not use his full strength, he was still wearing his jarn grape. Narbrel looked back at Ains with tear-filled eyes, a look of surprise and confusion on her face, as though Ains had grievously wounded her with that strike. However, Ains paid her no heed and asked the counter girl, and who is this person who has asked for me by name? The moment those words cleared his mouth, Ains cursed himself. Who else could it be but the boy in front of him? That would be Nfiri Abarisan. I just heard that name, as Ains thought this, the boy approached him. 